I've been following this news story coming out of the South China Sea where some dramatic video shows some action near Sabina Shoal. That's a shoal 87 miles west of the Philippines and some 700 miles south of mainland China, where Chinese and Philippine Coast Guard uh, collided in the early morning hours of August 19th. Take a look at this video. The Chinese Coast Guard vessel maneuvers in front of the Philippine Coast Guard vessel, causing a collision. After contact, though, the Chinese Coast Guard vessel pushes in to the collision, increasing the damage instead of slowing. A very deliberate act. Now, the U.S. has responded in full support of the Philippines, as we have in the past. But they also reminded that Article 4 of our Mutual Defense Treaty is now in effect in that armed attacks on public vessels, including Philippine Coast Guard vessels, meet uh, and are in accordance with the constitutional process of pursuing Article 4, which is the diplomatic and military defense of the Philippine Islands. Uh, this is a surprising threat to China from our administration because in the three and a half years that we've had the current administration, they've never enacted Article 4 to this level. I find this quite unexpected. And I think the Chinese did too because they did not address it immediately. They clearly had a prepared response because the very next morning, just a few hours later, uh, China responded accusing the Philippine Coast Guard of intruding into waters without permission, implying that China has uh, authority and sovereignty over the Sabina Shoal, which they do not legally, even though they claim it. They also blame the Chinese Coast Guard for the collision because that ship disregarded warnings ending in the collision with the Chinese Coast Guard vessel, where the video clearly shows the Chinese vessel was maneuvering in front of the, co of the Philippine Coast Guard vessel as the collision happened. So China then has changed their story here with their spokeswoman saying that because the Philippine Coast Guard brought a film crew on board, they clearly planned to enable or cause a collision to document it on video. And therefore it's their fault anyway, which I find ridiculous and laughable, but that's their story now. The damage to the Philippine Coast Guard vessel is shown here. It is significant and it's gonna require repair. There's literally a hole in the ship that's gonna to have to be patched. They'll probably just cut that whole area out and uh, you know just rebuild that section of the boat. But it's clear that this ship is no longer seaworthy until those repairs are either patched or completely uh, fixed. Now, after decades of Chinese aggression in the South China Sea, going all the way back to the 1990s, China continues to accuse the victims of Chinese aggression as being the instigator. In the United States, we have a term for this behavior uh, called an abusive relationship. And that's a relationship between two or more parties where one party holds a physical or psychological dominance over another partner. And this unethical behavior has been enabled and allowed to escalate for 30 years now. So 30 years of passive reinforcement that has concluded in a Chinese delusion of sovereignty over shoals and atolls some 700 miles away. Any suggestion that China does not have authority, right, and sovereignty in any region China decides is then characterized as being an aggressive policy and escalatory towards China. The fact is, China's delusional. China's delusion has become reinforced in their own minds to justify violence now against the Philippine people. This fantasy is dangerous, and if it's left unchecked, it's going to lead to actual fighting between China and its neighbors. Now, I want to point out that our senior military leaders, like uh, Major General Pat uh, writer here routinely and often remind the media and by extension the Chinese um, authorities that the U.S. has the capability and now with Article 4 the mutual defense authority to take action to ensure force protection by force projection in the Philippines. Our diplomatic corps, State Department leaders, have been careful not to threaten military action until now. This is a change. So both military and diplomatic representatives are reminding China that they have no authority in the South China Sea as it pertains to Philippine claims at the Second Thomas Shoal and other areas like the Sabina Shoal. Those issues were resolved legally in an international court formally in 2015. Now, I would like to take a moment 
to speak what the diplomatic representatives cannot or choose not to. So let's address the idea of escalation in the South China Sea. China continues to accuse the United States of escalation of force, while it is China who is clearly harassing and harming Filipinos at sea, like again in this photo, where this little ship is trying to make a supply drop to Second Thomas Shoal to the Philippine Marines there, and they're being intercepted by the Chinese Coast Guard. So let me just provide one example of what the United States military escalation could look like. This is the quiet part out loud. This is the reality that neither military nor political leaders want to speak publicly. But it is important that China gets this message. The United States has the capability to deliver guided munitions over the South China Sea without detection. You won't see it. The United States has the capability to identify, target, and provide weapon guidance over the South China Sea without detection. Advanced radars may see the F-35. They will not see the weapon guidance telemetry provided by the F-35. The United States also has an anti-ship munition announced publicly two years ago, specifically designed to receive telemetry guidance in flight without detection. This weapon has demonstrated the ability to sink medium-sized vessels in approximately 40 seconds. This weapon can be employed today, right now, anywhere in the Western Pacific. It's ready to go and has been for a while. This is what the United States escalation could look like, but we have not escalated. If anything, the United States is guilty of enabling China into a false sense of bravado. The reality is China's Coast Guard is operating now at the convenience of the United States military. And if China doesn't understand these conditions, if they continue to operate like they've been operating now for 30 years, there will be a demonstration without detection, leaving little evidence as to what happened. And if you don't think the U.S. has conducted an operation like this without detection, leaving very little evidence, and then denying any involvement, you're not paying attention. I want to take a minute and talk about how I read and research my news stories now using Ground News. This is a great website that I subscribe to with my Vantage Plan. But before I even get into that, I want to thank the people at Ground News that added this dark theme to the front page so I can save my eyesight from the moment I open the page not getting blasted with all that light. I really do appreciate that. So the story we just talked about was China accuses the Philippines of deliberately crashing one of their ships into a Chinese vessel. That's just kind of a summary of what happened. If we click the bias comparison, it will break down the left, center, and right titles for us in this summary. So it says here, the left and center emphasize the Chinese narrative. They're taking the Chinese perspective on this event, framing the Philippines as provocative and responsible for the collision. That's good to know. The right-leaning news sites add a layer of criticism from Western nations against China's action, suggesting a broader geopolitical narrative. Now, what's interesting about that is we did a, uh, a video earlier this month, the left-leaning websites that had the broader geopolitical narrative. It ended up being a false narrative in that case, but just know that it's not always the right and not always the left that are spinning or adding an additional layer of claim to the title and the story and the perspective. That is fantastic. Before I even read my first story, I already have a good understanding of where these sites are coming from. And But let's talk about the tools we have before we even get into the story. Over here on the right-hand side, we have the coverage details that tells us we have 125 total news sources talking about this event. That's great for me because I'm gonna get lots of different perspectives. Uh, it says left-leaning sources were 26 in number, right-leaning was 20, center was 27. That's a pretty even distribution between left, center, and right covering the story. And if it wasn't that apparent, you could even open up the bias distribution right here and see that, that specifically 36% left, 37% center, 27% right. 
It even classifies what news sites are center and which ones are right, if you didn't know. That's a great tool. If you scroll down even farther, you can see the factuality tool right here. I love this tool because it gives me an idea before I go into the story in depth, like I'm going to, uh, how reliable are the sources. So we have 61% high factuality. That's great for me. I can trust what I'm reading from these high factuality sites. It also lists the untracked factuality sites right here. These might be high factuality, but we don't know. So I keep that in perspective as I read their titles and their stories of this event. Ground News covers news all over the world. You can download their app and uh, watch the news stories on your phone or do it on the website like I'm doing here. It's the same and it's very versatile. It's a very powerful tool for anyone who wants to better understand news. So I want you to scan the QR code and use my link in the description, ground.news forward slash subbrief and save 40% off the Vantage plan. That's the plan that I use. That's the plan I'm using right now. And it's great. You're going to save a lot of money using my link or just scan the QR code if you have your phone with you. All right, let's stick with China. A friend of the channel, H.I. Sutton, has published a story in Naval News about a new submarine conducting pier side construction and testing right now in the Wuhan shipyard. This ship has been launched probably in April of this year and appears to be a conventionally powered submarine. But it has an X rudder configuration and VLS cells along the deck behind the sail. So at first appearance, this could be just another variant, maybe a fourth version of their most successful conventionally powered submarine, the Type 039. Uh, this, the jury is still out on this. We don't have a classification for this. It appears to be a new version of submarine, maybe even a new class of submarine. There is some speculation that it also might just be a modified Kilo class submarine because the length matches very close to an old school Kilo, but Kilo doesn't have VLS behind the sail or anywhere on it. So no matter what it is, it's certainly new. Uh, but my gut instinct is that this is going to be a new version, a fourth variant, if you will, of the Type 039 uh, conventionally powered Chinese submarine. I also want to give a lot of credit to Tom Shugart, Shugart, pardon me for saying your name wrong if I did, for these photos. He was the ones that found the photos, labeled the photos, shared them on Twitter all the way back, I believe it was in May or April, and um, we've been watching it since. And H.I. Sutton has written a piece on this in Naval News that I would encourage everyone to uh, go check out. So that's really all the information we have right now about a new construction of a conventionally powered submarine in Wuhan, China. Not really going to speculate much more until we see the submarine finished, commissioned, and then we'll see where it's tested and what its capabilities actually are. Uh, let's move on. Sticking with the Chinese area, the USS Ralph Johnson DDG-114 trans transited the Taiwan Strait in a freedom of navigation exercise. And that's just, again, reminding China, despite what they may believe and how they act and treat other countries, like in the South China Sea, that there's still an international waterway between Taiwan and China. And it's perfectly reasonable and legal for warships to conduct safe passage peacefully in these international lanes. So we have done this multiple times this year, as have the Canadians and other countries, and we just continue to uh, be the most recent one now to have conducted this freedom of navigation exercise. It was monitored by the Chinese Navy, which is absolutely within their right. They did make a comment that the Chinese Army stands ready to defend China from American aggression. Um, and they find actions like this aggressive, which is a little, you know, funny to me, simply driving by or sailing by uh, their country in international waters. But that's been their response to these types of freedom of navigation exercises for years. And they continue that tradition. 
Something kind of interesting coming out of the AUKUS deal. You remember the agreement we had with Australia, uh, the United Kingdom, and the United and the U.S., where we focused really on the nuclear submarines. We're selling some Virginias to the Virginia cloud to the uh, Australians. Uh, UK is going to build a new version of of submarine for for the Australians as well and themselves. Well, that agreement includes a lot of other technologies like quantum computing, computing, uh, AI integration, and other. Uh, devices like this extremely large, or XL, UUV, Unmanned Underwater Vehicle. This is called the Ghost Shark, and we're looking at Hall 2 here. Early th this year, uh, Australia had built Hall 1. All of these are built in Australia, working with the Americans. Uh, this one was sent to the United States for testing. So while Ghost Shark Hall 1 continues testing off the coast of Australia right now, Hall 2 will be off the coast of the United States conducting testing over here and we'll be comparing notes and learning how to more effectively in, you know, in, improve this technology together and employ it at sea. Um, if more comes out of this in the future, we'll cover it again. I think XL UUVs will become the submarines of the future eventually. No time soon, but eventually they'll be getting rid of the crew, I believe, and just uh, having many UUVs uh, going around underneath the oceans of the world. And this is just another step towards that, that future. Very interesting technology. All right, let's take a look at this awesome uh, United States Naval Institute infographic. They publish this weekly. It is just a general overview of our fleet deployments around the world to give you an idea of what the U.S. Navy is doing and give our sailors a lot of credit because they're out there working hard every day, being away from their families for months at a time. Uh, and, you know, they get very little recognition because they're always at sea, away from shore, away from the cameras and the news and the, and the, and the spotlight. So we're going to give them some credit here. The big news really this week is finally, after seven weeks of leaving the United States, the Abraham Lincoln has finally entered the Indian Ocean. If you remember, she was ordered in a very public way by the Secretary of Defense on two occasions in the last seven weeks to get to the CENTCOM region in response to Iran's threats to attack Israel uh, over two weeks ago now. Now, that attack has not happened yet. And now that the Abraham Lincoln is in position to uh, deter or respond to any attacks, we're in a much better position to either stop or do something about that. I find it interesting that Iran, uh, who has already done a mass cruise missile and ballistic missile attack on Israel once already this year and threatened to do it a second time, has waited this long. It's been over two weeks now since they've made that threat. And since they have acted on those threats in the past, everyone expected them to do it a second time. But something that is parallel to what's happening now that happened during their first attack in April is they did wait seven to 10 days after they made their threat and public announcement telegraphing that they're going to attack Israel. Uh, that gave the Americans a uh, great time to get into position to defend Israeli airspace over Saudi Arabia, over Jordan, you know, the airspace between Israel and Iran. And because we had that notice and that time, we shot down the majority of those missiles. Very few missiles coming out of Iran even made it into Israeli airspace. And the few that did, Israel was able to manage. So that appears to be happening again. Iran makes an announcement, they're declaring they're going to take offensive action, and then they wait for the Americans to get in position to defend Israel, which is counterintuitive, but that appears to be the pattern here. And what's ironic or funny about this to me is that the Abraham Lincoln took seven weeks to transit from the west coast of the United States to Hawaii, Guam. Uh, they conducted an operation with the Italian Navy for a photo op in the South China Sea. And then they finally made it through the Straits of Malacca into the Indian Ocean some seven weeks later in a transit trip that normally takes in the vicinity of three weeks, half the time it actually took. So it would appear as if the Abraham Lincoln is not in any hurry to get in position to respond to Iran. That may not be the intention, but that is certainly the appearance. And the fact that Iran has waited so long to conduct the attack 
makes it appear as if they're waiting for the Americans to get in position again, which makes no sense unless Iran is not serious about attacking Israel. That is the last possibility. Maybe it's always been for show. Maybe they've always telegraphed these responses and attacks so that nothing actually happens other than America defending Israel again. That might be the case here. Uh, I should mention um, accompanying the Abraham Lincoln is Destroyer Squadron 21 and Air Wing 9. So it is a complete carrier strike group uh, in the Indian Ocean now. They're on their way in the direction of the Persian Gulf. I want to wait and see if they actually go into the Persian Gulf. They certainly don't need to to uh, conduct their operations. They can do it from the Arabian Gulf. Hell, they can do it from where they're at now. So they're already in position. Uh, the second unit that had some publicity recently is the USS Georgia SSGN uh, cruise missile submarine. Carries like 154 cruise missiles, right? It, it's also called a missile truck, which I think is quite, quite funny because that's literally what it is. Now, she has been reported again as of April 20th by the Pentagon news brief that they're still in the Mediterranean and they haven't entered the CENTCOM AOR yet, uh, area responsibility. But they also said that about the Abraham Lincoln, which was clearly not true because on April or on August 20th, rather, there they were in the uh, Indian Ocean. So... Uh, it is possible that the USS Georgia is also in CENTCOM AOR now, and they're just not going to provide any more updates on that because they don't normally tell the public where the submarines are at, which I appreciate. So let's just assume that USS Georgia is also in the Indian Ocean. That's very likely at this point. Uh, again, she can conduct her mission from the Mediterranean. Uh, her missiles are very long range. If they wanted to strike targets in Iran, they certainly could do it from the Med. They don't have to be anywhere else to, to do that. But she was announced and ordered publicly by the Secretary of Defense weeks ago to go to the CENTCOM AOR, which includes the Indian Ocean. That's where we expect her to be. All right, let's keep it moving back here to the United States. We have a lot going on at home. The Harry S. Truman is getting ready for her overseas deployment. That's going to happen over the holidays this year and well into next year. And sometimes that just happens. You get assigned to a ship and uh, when your rotation for deployment comes up, sometimes it's over the holiday season. It's never fun when that happens, but we all take our turns doing it. This year, Harry S. Truman and her accompanying destroyers and air wing will be away from home. Uh, so good, good good luck to all of them, and we'll see them next year when they come back. They haven't left yet. They're still doing their work up, but they don't plan on being here for the holidays. So not fun for them. Uh, but a big welcome home to the USS Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, uh, aircraft carrier and crew, uh, were forward deployed to Japan for many years. Something like nine years, I think it was. So some people can join the Navy, get assigned to the Ronald Reagan and spend their entire enlistment in Japan, which is great, by the way. Uh, but she finally came home to her home port, Bremerton, Washington, where she's going to go through a long uh, maintenance availability and refit period. Uh, well deserved. You know, you know, being forward deployed like that for so many years is very arduous duty in my opinion and so it's great to see them finally cycle out and uh, and come back home and uh, i want to leave you with this uh this is a this is gunner's mate second class dustin mason he's from the uh, uss carl vinson aircraft carrier out of san diego they did a friends and family cruise which is like a day cruise where they take uh everyone out just for a day do some flight ops. It's great for, you know, showing your family what you actually do whenever you're at sea. And uh, he's singing some song here. And this picture just struck me. This is this is Navy hotness right here. He should put this on his Tinder profile. You know, I love this picture. So anyway, so from one sailor to another, big salute to uh, Gunner's Mate First Class Dustin Mason and the entire crew of uh, Carl Vinson. Um, hope you guys had fun on your friends and family day out of San Diego, California. Good times, man. Love, love to see this stuff. This is sailors having fun. That's what it's all about in the end, right? All right. Hey, remember to use my link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen to get 40% off your Vantage subscription. That's the subscription that I have to Ground News. Take advantage of it. It's worth it. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. See ya.